Good morning and welcome to the service of morning prayer for Wednesday the 29th of October. It's the last week of our uh, Christian calendar uh, before Advent. It's good to be with you uh, for this Christ the King week. Lord, open our lips and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. The Lord is our refuge and our strength. O come, let us worship. Our psalm for this morning is Psalm 98. O sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvellous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gained him victory. The Lord has made known his victory. He has revealed his vindication in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the victory of our God. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with a lyre, and with the lyre and the sound of melody, with trumpets and the sound of the horn. Make a joyful noise before the King, the Lord. Let the sea roar and all that fills it, the world and those who live in it. Let the fl floods clap their hands, let the hills sing together for joy at the presence of the Lord, for he is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The first reading is taken from Daniel chapter 5, reading from verse 1 to 6, and then from verse 13 to 28. King Belshazzar made a great festival for a thousand of his lords, and he was drinking wine in the presence of the thousand. Under the influence of the, the wine, Belshazzar commanded that they bring in the vessels of gold and silver that his father, Nebuchadnezzar, had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem, so that the kings and his lords, his wives and his concubines might drink from them. So they brought in the vessels of gold and silver that had been taken from the temple and the house of God in Jerusalem. And the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines drank from them. They drank the wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood and stone. Immediately the fingers of a human hand appeared and began to write on the plaster of the wall of the royal palace next to the lampstand. The king was watching the hand as it wrote. Then the king's face turned pale and his thoughts terrified him. His limbs gave way and his knees knocked together. Then Daniel was brought in before the king. The king said to Daniel, So you are Daniel, one of the exiles of Judah, whom my father the king brought from Judah. I have heard of you, that a spirit of the gods is in you, and that enlightenment, understanding, and excellent wisdom are found in you. Now the wise men, the enchanters, have been brought in before me to read this writing and tell me its interpretation, but they are not able to give the interpretation of the matter. But I have heard that you can give interpretations and solve problems. Now if you're able to read the writing and tell me its interpretation, you shall be clothed in purple, have a chain of gold around your neck, and the rank third in the kingdom. Then Daniel answered in the presence of the king, Let your gifts be for yourself, or give your rewards to someone else. Nevertheless, I will read the writing to the king, and let him know the interpretation. O King, the Most High God gave your father Nebuchadnezzar kingship, greatness, glory, and majesty. And because of the greatness that he gave him, all peoples, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. He killed those he wanted to kill, kept alive those he wanted to keep alive, honored those he wanted to honor, and degraded those who he wanted to degrade. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened, so he acted proudly, he was dep deposed, from his kingly throne, and his glory was stripped from him. He was driven from human society, and his mind was made like that of an animal. His dwelling was with wild asses. He was fed grass like oxen, and his body was bathed with the dew of heaven. Until he learned that the Most High God was sovereign over the kingdom of mortals, and sets over it whoever, whoever he wills. And you, Belshazzar, his son, have not humbled your heart, even though you knew all this, 
You have exalted yourself against the Lord of heavens. The vessel of this temple have been brought in before you, and you and your lords and your wives and your concubines have been drinking wine from them. You have praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood and stone, which do not see or hear or know. But the God in whose power is their, their very breath, to whom belong all your ways, you have not honoured. So from his presence the hand was sent, and the writing was inscribed. And this is the writing that was inscribed, Mene, Mene, Tekel, and Parson. This is interpretation of the matter. Mene, God has numbered the days of your kingdom, and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Here what the Spirit is saying to the church, Thanks be to God. Our Gospel reading for this morning is taken from Luke chapter 21, reading from verse 10 to 19. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Then Jesus said to them, Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes and in various places famine and plagues, and there will be dreadful portents and great signs from heaven. But before all this occurs, they will arrest you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors because of my name. This will give you an opportunity to testify, so make up your minds not to prepare your defense in advance. For I'll give you words and a wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, by relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. You will be hated by all because of my name, but not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance you will gain your souls. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. In all the turmoil of the world events, one wonders what the end game is. Luke 21 is almost entirely given over to eschatology, or theology of the end times, that starts with Jesus' prediction on the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. Jesus' teaching is constantly caveated with two warnings, one of false prophets or messianic figures, and the second on the unpredictability of the age. The section we have set for us today is on the unpredictability element of our eschatology, or end times. It actually starts in verse 9. When you hear of wars and insurrections, do not be terrified, for these things must take place first, but the end will not follow immediately. As I've said before, the eschatological teaching of Jesus is not there to instill fear in us. In contrast, it's meant to bring us comfort. Do not be afraid. This is not because we all will escape the suffering of such turmoil and conflict, or the anticipated persecution that precedes it, but rather because we'll know the presence of Christ even in these things. As in all circumstances, a biblical theology of suffering never assumes that the ho those who are of faith escape such suffering. Hardly. But in the midst of such suffering, we always know the presence and grace of God that helps us endure. Jesus ties these two concepts together in a way that suggests that in the midst of persecution we will give him the words to utter in our own defense and the endurance to know that even in death there is hope. You will gain your souls. What we need to recognize within this is a contrasting view of the self to our own. Not as a body containing a soul but rather a soul contained within a body. Here the primary self is the soul that, for the period of existence, is embodied. In pre-modern thought, the torment of the body is temporary, but the torment of the soul is eternal. One of the theological concepts we need to struggle with is the idea that under all circumstances God is sovereign. We may be able to conclude that from the reading from Daniel, that God uses Nebuchadnezzar and his son Belshazzar to bring about God's will. The theological difficulty is that this view leads us to assume that God is then complicit in suffering, that God causes it to happen, 
and in a way that is contradictory to the nature of a loving being. Such a view also makes no sense of the idea that God will hold those who inflict such suffering to account. Why would God make somebody do such harm and then hold them accountable for their actions when it was the will of God? A more consistent view might be suggest that God allows suffering and consistently enters into the suffering of humanity as an act of love. Thus, within the biblical narrative, it's most obvious in the passion of Christ. God continues to journey with us in the midst of suffering, the very concept of compassion to suffer with another. Grants us endurance in the midst of what we go through and then draws us into the big picture of hope. That is ultimately what Psalm 98 is all about. It has that wonderful opening line to it. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gained him victory. In some translations, brought salvation. That call to praise encompasses all of reality. Nations, ends of the earth, all the earth, the roaring sea, the world and all who live in it, the hills. Why? Because God has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness, his chassid, and will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. That word victory can also be translated as salvation. And the psalm has a parallel in, in Isaiah 52 that talks of the return of the exiles from captivity in Babylon. Not as an act of military conquest, but a moment of grace and compassion in the midst of exile and alienation. Isaac Watts used the psalm as a basis for our Christian hymn, Joy to the World. In doing so, he continued in that well-established Christian tradition of seeing in Christ's kinship one who brought joyous salvation rather than oppression and misery. As we anticipate the end of the church year and enter the season of Advent, we pray for and anticipate a vastly different reality to the one we see around us. We anticipate a kingdom of hope, of joy, peace and love in the midst of profound suffering. We anticipate justice and equity in a world of injustice and inequality. But pray, pray God that we too may embody these aspirations in our daily life as we show compassion and encouragement to those who suffer and hope in the midst of all those things that bring us terror. Amen. We affirm our faith together in Hear, O Israel. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first and the great commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. And continuing in our reflections and prayers, um, uh, since uh, um, all souls, all saints, we continue using our Celtic prayer. For fruitfulness, we thank you. For a generous spirit, we thank you. For wisdom and faith, we thank you. For old age and new birth, we thank you. For those who have gone before us, seed planted in rich pasture with a hope of eternal life, may their enduring spirit live on enriching and empowering our lives. Their love linger, their presence be near, until we meet once more. For your embracing love, a father's love, a mother's love, the love that sees our failings and forgives us, the love that sees our joys and embraces us, the love that knows no end or beginning, a love that could die for us. We bless you. We pray our colleague. Almighty and everlasting God, whose will it is to restore all things in your well-beloved Son, our Lord and King, grant that the peoples of the earth, now divided and enslaved by sin, may be freed and brought together under his gentle and loving rule, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And gathering our prayers and praises into one, let us pray as our Saviour has taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. 
Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. A couple of notices for this week, just a reminder, this coming Saturday, the 2nd of December, we have our parish Christmas dinner, and there are 100 tickets available. I'm not sure how many are left, but I don't think there are many. Uh, $20 for adults, $10 for children, and uh, between the ages of 6 and 12, and children under 5 are free. And the tickets are available from the parish office. And just a reminder that we have our next men's breakfast on Wednesday, December the 6th um, at the Breakfast House on Bayfield Street. And all men are welcome to attend. And if you were in church on Sunday, you likely received your December newsletter, Christmas letter and a brochure with all of our regional ministry, Christmas services and events. If you weren't in church uh, and are on our mailing list, a copy has been mailed to you. Please take time to read these over and feel free to join us or any of our parish churches as you're able for this Advent and Christmas season. If you don't receive our mail and would like to, then do contact our church office. This coming Sunday is Advent 1 and you'll notice a slight change to our liturgy. Well, not slight, quite significant actually. We will have the lighting of our Advent wreath as we normally do on Advent 1 and then we're going to be borrowing a, a liturgy um, for Advent from the Moravian Church. As you may be aware, we are now in communion with the Moravian Church and sharing liturgical resources together. And so I thought it would be an interesting exercise for us to borrow uh, the Moravian service um, up until uh, the peace. And so that's what we'll do this coming Sunday and the four Sundays of Advent. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen.